Okay, we're going to go through the medulla now, and we're going to divide this into two parts. The medulla before the opening of the fourth ventricle and then after the opening of the fourth ventricle. So at this point, at the pyramidal decussation, and here's a, here's a view of the pyramidal decussation. Here's the spinal cord, here are the pyramids, and here's one of these examples where the decussation is marked by simply a jog in the midline. And what you see here, this is a cross section right through that jog, not that jog, but a jog, um, is a cross section that has been stained with myelin. So black is where there is white matter, and the white is where there is the, where there are cells, neurons. Okay, so this doesn't look horribly different from a uh, from a spinal cord section. First of all, we still have a central canal. It's clogged up and we can't see it, but we know it's right about here. Uh, and second of all, we have this right here, which looks very much uh, very similar to the dorsal horn. And finally, we have this bit right here, which looks very similar to the dorsal columns. And these are all uh, apt similarities. So let's just go through what we have here. We're going to start with the lemniscal pathway. The lemniscal pathway is uh, marked by the dorsal columns. And what you have, remember that the central part of that is the fasciculus gracilis that takes light touch proprioception and vibration information from the ipsilateral leg and lower trunk. That's gracilis. And then fasciculus cuneatus, which is ipsilateral arm plus upper trunk. Again, light touch vibration proprioception. And I say this over and over again because you absolutely have to learn this. I repeat it so that you're so bored that you learn it instead of um, not learning it. Okay, you have to learn it. So what you notice here is that fasciculus cuneatus is properly black. That means this is all fibers. But look at what's happened to gracilis. It's all gray. There's a lot of white in here. And what's happening is those dorsal column fibers, those axons that are coming in from the periphery, it's the same, that, that sensory afferents going all the way up, it's synapsing in the dorsal column nucleus. And the dorsal there are two dorsal column nuclei, one for fasciculus gracilis, one for fasciculus cuneatus. They are not surprisingly named nucleus gracilis and nucleus cuneatus. Collectively, they are called the dorsal column nuclei. And here they start. They start at the very back of the, uh, of the um, medulla. So gracilis, just as the fasciculus gracilis started before fasciculus cuneatus, it deals with more caudal parts of the body, uh, also nucleus gracilis starts before nucleus cuneatus. Okay, so that's our, um, that is our lemniscal pathway. What about the spinothalamic tract? The spinothalamic tract is traveling right here. It was here in the spinal cord. It's still right here in the ventrolateral quadrant in the, in the medulla. And what about the corticospinal tract? The corticospinal tract is in the pyramids, uh, or, uh, but it's, it's in, the, in these pyramids, and as it descends, as it comes down from the medulla, this information is traveling off to where it's going to travel in the, uh, in the spinal cord, which is off here in the dorsal lateral chimney or dorsal lateral funiculus. So the, this crossing contains axons that are descending from motor cortex and making their way over to here. So if there is a lesion in the spinal cord, you have a loss of ipsilateral vol voluntary mo motor control. But if you have a lesion in the medulla above the, sen abo above the motor decussation, you have a lesion, you have an impairment of contralateral voluntary movement. Great. What else can we see here? We can see a little bit of uh, leftover of what would be the ventral horn. And this is, in fact, the, the ventral horn that gives rise to the spinal accessory nucleus. Okay, so some or I'm sorry, the spinal accessory nerve. So some people will call this the spinal accessory nucleus. 
It is giving rise to motor, it has, contains motor neurons, motor neurons that innervate the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius muscles. And they reach the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles through cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve. What other cranial nerve uh, nuclei are present here? Well, the next one that's really important is this one right here. This is the spinal trigeminal nucleus. And as we'll see in a little bit, information, you remember that the trigeminal nerve carries sensory information. The, mo the bulk of what it does is carry sensory information from the face and oral cavity. And that comes in to the side of the pons. And once it comes in, it does not, it does not just deal with the pons. It sends its axons down a tract all the way to the cervical cord, in fact. And here is that tract. This is called the spinal, tri spinal trigeminal tract. And as it travels down, the length of the, the medulla and, and halfway through the pons, it gives off, the axons give off uh, collaterals. They send information into a nucleus called the spinal trigeminal nucleus. That spinal trigeminal nucleus also is present from cervical levels to uh, the mid-pons. Here, behind the opening of the fourth ventricle, the spinal trigeminal nucleus is particularly important. It's called pars caudalis. It's spinal trigeminal nucleus pars caudalis. Another name for it is the medullary dorsal horn because it looks just exactly as the dorsal horn looks, but it's in the medulla, so the medullary dorsal horn. So the medullary dorsal horn is important for pain and temperature processing of the, of the ipsilateral face and oral cavity. If there is a lesion here, there will be a loss of, uh, of sensation uh, for the ipsilateral face and oral cavity. Things you have to worry about are protecting the cornea. Remember that if you can't detect foreign matter in your cornea, uh, you can't blink to protect your, your cornea from, from uh, harm. And so that's a problem. Um, moreover, remember that sensory lesions give rise to positive symptoms. And so a lesion in the spinal trigeminal tract or nucleus is going to give rise to, a, is typically going to give rise to dysesthesia, a feeling of pins and needles in the uh, ipsilateral face oral cavity. It could be a feeling of, of um, frank pain. Okay. There are some other uh, uh, cranial nerve nuclei present uh, around the spinal, uh, around the central canal, but we won't, um, we won't go into those because they're poorly defined here. Uh, and we'll leave that for the next section. Okay, so we have dorsal columns giving rise to the dorsal column nuclei, gracilis, cuneatus. We have this medullary dorsal horn, spinal accessory nucleus, the crossing of uh, pyramidal uh, sp corticospinal tract fibers off to, to go to their uh, spinal location, and we have the traveling of the spinothalamic tract. Now we're going to go just a step further, and now it doesn't, this no longer looks anything reminiscent of a spinal cord section. Now we have a proper pyramid. We have proper pyramids. You can see this is not crossing, it's above the crossing. So now the pyramid, this pyramid, is con contains information that is going to control the opposite side of the body. Okay, very important. This pyramid is controlling contralateral voluntary movement. We still have uh, nucleus gracilis, and gracilis is, is there's even fewer uh, fibers, there's fewer, there's less black here, so this is more realized, Physic, uh, nucleus gracilis, and now we have this nucleus cuneatus is growing, although there are still fibers from fasciculus uh, cuneatus that have not yet terminated. Here are the two dorsal column nuclei. We're starting to get these fibers. Do you see how there are fibers that arc around? These fibers are called internal arcuate fibers. They come from the dorsal column nuclei, both nucleus gracilis and cuneatus. They come, they send their axons out in a lovely 
a graceful arc. They cross the midline, and then they come shooting up right here. Right here is where the medial lemniscus travels. So for dorsal columns, we have a lot. This is a packed section. Dorsal column nuclei, internal arcuate fibers, medial lemniscus. Everything is ipsilateral function, ipsilateral function, and then once you get to medial lemniscus, it's contralateral function. Although it sits right on midline, so it might be that you, you actually affect uh, function bilaterally with one lesion. Okay, so the dorsal column nuclei, right over here are the uh, spinothalamic tract, so it's still sitting in the same, uh, essentially in the same area. Um, pyramids, spinothalamic tract, dorsal column nuclei. We still have the medullary dorsal horn. You can see the spinal trigeminal tract and the spinal trigeminal nucleus or medullary dorsal horn. So here is crani the crani one of the important cranial nerves, uh, nuclei cranial nerve nuclei associated with the trigeminal nerve. Actually, arguably the most important cranial nerve nucleus associated with the trigeminal nerve. Up here in this area here, there are, there are developing some collections of cells. And here what we, we are aided by understanding the, orga the developmental organization. This is essentially um, the core gray matter of, uh, uh, of the medulla at this level. And imagine that the, spot, that the central canal is right about here. And there is a separation between a sensory dorsal part and a motor ventral part. This most midline motor part is somatomotor. It, goes, it contains the hypoglossal nucleus. Hypoglossal nucleus is going to send its axons out, and they're going to exit just lateral to the pyramids. Hypoglossal nucleus, then right next to that is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus, an autonomic outflow goes to parasympathetics of the body above the hindgut. And then above that is a sensory nucleus that receives information from the viscera. This is the nucleus of the solitary tract, nucleus of the solitary tract. So, uh, and we'll see, the, we'll see these a little bit better in the, in the next section. Before we go on, I want to um, point out one more thing on this section, and that is that at the same place where the spinothalamic tract travels, right here, right here, right here, okay, this is the ventrolateral part of the medulla, there's another tract that's coming in the opposite direction. The spinothalamic tract is carrying pain and temperature from the opposite side of the body up towards the thalamus, right here. And coming down from the hypothalamus in the same area are axons that are going to say, go, go, go to the, uh, the sympathetic preganglionics that innervate the, uh, the, the, the face. So innervate, say, the um, superior tarsal muscle, innervate the uh, pupillary uh, constrictor, um, innervate, I, I'm sorry, the pupillary dilator, um, and innervate uh, autonomic outflow to the uh, sweat glands of the face and to the blood vessels of the face. So if there is interruption of these fibers, it's as though you cut the outflow from T1, T2, which gives rise to, remember, remember, Horner syndrome. So a lesion here, which happens, and we will come back to this, this happens pretty frequently in one of the, uh, it's probably the most frequent brainstem stroke, affects this area right here. And what you get with that is a ipsilateral Horner syndrome. Not because you've cut the, the outflow, but because you've cut the excitatory uh, projection. And without that excitatory projection, those autonomic, uh, those sympathetic uh, preganglionics are not active and they do not 
uh, excite the superior tarsal, so you have ptosis. They do not excite the uh, pupillary dilator, so you have meiosis, a constricted pupil. They do not excite the, um, the, the sweat glands of the face, so you have anhydrosis, no sweating. And you uh, do not get um, dilation of the, uh, I'm sorry, you do not get constriction of the blood vessels, so you get facial flushing. Okay. Now we're going to go through one more section and take a break. Here we have moved a little bit farther forward. Okay, and what you can see is we have some we have some uh, common uh, features. One common feature are, is the pyramids. Here are the pyramids. This is information coming down from the same side, the motor cortex on the same side, going to control muscles of the arms and legs on the opposite side, and also going to control, uh, say, the hypoglossal and spinal accessory nucleus. So corticospinal and corticobulbar are, are present here. Right here is the medial lemniscus. It is mostly completely uh, formed. There might be, there's a little bit of cu nucleus cuneatus left over, uh, but mostly the, dors the uh, lemniscal pathway is present here in the medial lemniscus. This medial lemniscus carries information from the opposite side about proprioception, light touch, and vibration. This medial lemniscus uh, carries information from the other side, and these medial lemnisci are going to go to the thalamus on the same side and ultimately reach cortex on the same side. So we've got the pyramids, the medial lemniscus. The spinothalamic tract is still over here, and it's traveling at the same place as the oculosympathetic pathway, uh, the interruption of which will give you a Horner syndrome, ipsilateral Horner syndrome. What else do we have? We have, uh, we have the, the spinal trigeminal nucleus, the medullary dorsal horn is still here. It's getting, it's getting smaller, but there it is. We still have some internal arcuate fibers that are uh, traveling off to the uh, medial lemniscus. And now we have a little bit more, uh, it's a little more clear what's going on in, the, in this central area. Here you can see, if you, if you really look in at this area right here, you see that this is kind of gray. This is the hypoglossal nucleus. So it's dead midline, it's ventral, that's hypoglossal nucleus. It is going to give rise, it has a one-to-one -one relationship with the hypoglossal nerve. The motor neurons that, uh, they're at, these axons of the motor neurons in the hypoglossal nucleus constitute the uh, hypoglossal nerve. And it sends, the hypoglossal uh, motor neurons send their axons out, and they go out just lateral to the pyramid and just medial to this thing. This uh, uh, elaborate looking uh, structure is just lateral to the pyramids. And if you remember, when we were looking at the outside of the brain, we saw these two little bumps on the outside of the pyramids. Those are, those we called them the olivary tubercles. And what I told you is that they contain uh, the teaching signal for the cerebellum. This is, it, these are called the inferior olives. So they are so large that they actually form a bump, and this is the olivary tubercle. So this is just the beginning of the uh, inferior olives. These are connected to the uh, cerebellum. They only connect to the cerebellum through the peduncles. Okay, so the hypoglossal nucleus sends its axons between the olive, inferior olives and the pyramids. Dorsal to that is it, right here is the dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. Dorsal motor nucleus of the vagus. And then you see this very particular uh, area where there's black and white. And sometimes the white is the island and sometimes the black is the island. It, it, has different appearances at different levels. This is the solitary tract and the nucleus of the solitary tract. The solitary tract contains information from the viscera. It comes in mostly from glossopharyngeal and vagus nerves um, with also contributions from facial nerve. Uh, and this is going to, in the caudal part right here, 
what it's dealing with is viscerosensory information, such as oxygen saturation or uh, lung inflation or GI, uh, the state of the, of, of the gastrointestinal um, uh, lumen, and so on. So this is getting feedback back from the viscera. It does not reach consciousness. You can't say, uh, my GI is, is, uh, is looking good, or my lungs are inflated, or my oxygen level is good, or my oxygen level is bad. You don't know any of this stuff. It simply comes into the central nervous system and then, then is used to automatically um, uh, arrange for homeostatic adjustments, okay? Doesn't reach consciousness, doesn't reach perceptual levels. In the rostral part, which we haven't gotten to, as the fourth ventricle opens up, what we will see is that the nucleus of the solitary tract deals with taste, okay? Taste. Okay, so that is, that's actually the hardest part of of the of the brainstem, we have a we have a, something to do, and uh, we have to go through a couple more sections in the medulla, which are also uh, fairly challenging. And then we're, we're then we're home free because the pons and the midbrain, re um, relatively speaking, are are really quite simple. Okay.